Yeah. What was the communications officer of a youth network with over 18,000 registered members in 70 countries have to say about networking communications? And what ideas do I have to share with policymakers, stakeholders, or people who don't consider themselves as youth or youth at heart? have to say about these two concepts of networking and communications when it comes to youth. Well, I have to say this. And I think it's quite clear, isn't it? <laughs> what I'm trying to say here is, don't ever mistake legibility for communication. This is a concept that was borrowed uh, from David Carson in the TED Talk in 2003. Uh, more often than not, I've observed that when stakeholders and policymakers, when they think they are communicating to you, the youth, they are actually drowning themselves in their own echo. More often than not, we think communication is a monologue, but communication is a dialogue. And this is another cue I wanna say. Uh, this actually inspires me to get married. Mm. <laughs> Pardon my use of uh, sarcasm. I don't think I'm getting the width of it yet. But another thing I can learn from this image is, is simply this, that in communication, speaking, or in this picture, shouting, is just the start. Engagement is the heart. And listening points you to the right path. And how did I learn this? Recently, I was talking to one of our major stakeholders uh, in a meeting, and the person went ahead to say, Pius, how do we really engage rural youth when it comes to issues about agriculture and rural advisory? And he went ahead to say, Pius, we have a lot of documents, a lot of documents. Let me quote him precisely. He said, um, we have well outlined reports and findings on thematic issues related to agriculture and rural youth. And I, interpre I interpolated, I said, like how many pages are these reports? He said, well, I can still remember assertive tone in his voice when he said, at least each report is approximately 30 pages. Pardon my math, I know it's not as good as Einstein. And they said they have over a hundred documents and that's just 3,000 pages. And I know it takes an average rural youth three minutes to read 3,000 documents. And uh, at this stage, I don't know if that is sarcasm or irony. But the truth still says is, little wonder we find out that most of these rural youth can remember pages of musical lyrics. And I think so. They can remember a lot of songs. But the concept of us engaging youth, I think we need to learn from musicians. I am not saying policymakers should now start forming the next band of Coldplay or Queen Band. Don't get me wrong, please. I am not saying that, and I'm not insinuating that. But what I'm saying is, there is something we can learn from musicians. And this leads me to the next thing. Huh? I would love to share some few success stories coming from Waipad, Kenya. And in Waipad, Kenya, recently, they have a collaboration with FAO, USAID, and GIZ, and they developed a vital role in Kenya's youth agribusiness, and that was the first time the youth will actively, actively, and I mean actively, not just a bunch of policymakers putting one youth up there. Even when I was looking at this picture, I can see a lot of youth there. <laughs> but they actively engaged youth from rural areas and they developed a particular strategy that fed, fed into the agricultural policy of the nation. And that is a cue we can learn from Waipat, Kenya. Also, there is a mentoring toolkit and I believe mentorship is another way we can have a dialogue not only a monologue, because I've often seen during the mentoring program that we did, this was uh, a toolkit funded by GIFAR, and Wipad led the initiative with IFSA and Howard, and it's a EU-funded project. 
This mentoring toolkit synthesizes a decade of learnings from mentoring programs from agriculture and also from forestry. And one thing I've learned is not only do the masters in the field, the policy makers, impact on the youth, there's a rub off on the youth from the youth to the policy makers also. Um, before I leave this very, very long presentation, um, I think that should be sarcasm, I don't know. But one thing I would like to conclude, yes, one thing I would like to conclude with this presentation is, there's a quote from the Eastern Africa that says, and I think a question comes to mind begging before I give that quote is, can policymakers, other related stakeholders, and the youth learn the art of collaboration from musicians? Is it possible we can work together? And the quote is simply, like he said in his first presentation, what you do for the youth, without them, you do to them. Tak, I think my Swedish is better than my Japanese. <laughs> Thank you so much, Piers. Yeah. It was really, yeah, inspiring in many ways, I think. <laughs> so, are there any questions for Piers from the audience? Ah, well, then maybe I can have a go, because I actually have one. Okay. Of all the things that you um, mentioned that policymakers and organizations can do to uh, include youth, what, in their work, what do you think is the most crucial, like if you have to choose one, where to start? Yeah, I think um, aside from forming a musical band, uh, <laughs> one thing I, will, I would actually choose is listening. Listening is key because um, more often than not, most policymakers I interact with, I've worked in the development sector for a decade and I entered the sector as a youth. I worked with World Bank funded projects and the rest. But one thing I've noticed is they develop a program and they toss it down to the youth and say, swallow it, this is for you. But it doesn't work that way. We can learn by listening to them. There's a recent, um, last year I promoted something online that IFA, IFA did with um, working with musicians in Africa, doing a dance program with the youth. And I even noticed policymakers found that hilarious, they were smiling, but in smiling they were listening also. So listening is key. Yeah. Mr. Easy, Mr. Easy, yeah, yes. yeah, that's it. We're going to have them in the GC performing. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and question? we have a question here. Uh, I'm Christine Ostergren, and uh, I'm from the company Juteboy, and we work with jute, high tech products, and farming also, agriculture in Bangladesh mostly. And I just want to say thank you, because you really put the point at it. Since five years back, we always bring our jute ambassador where we go, when we go to Bangladesh. And he happens to be one of the top 10 bass players of the world for a rock band. Mm. So when we start like a workshop with the farmers and the jute mill owners and the middlemen and, and the jute minister, we start off with a real, you know, head banging <laughs> and some heavy metal music. <laughs> and then everybody opens up. So you just said it, we do it with music. And then it's a lot of fun also. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thank you to you, Pius. Oh, Here's, you. of course, the Sianu bag. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>